Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Dario Health. Manage your blood glucose levels, increase your possibilities. By Jivo Kypopen, the first premixed auto injector for very low blood sugar. And by Dexcom. Help make knowledge your superpower with the Dexcom G6 Continuous Glucose Monitoring System. This is Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. This week, exercise with type 1 can be a challenge. You know there are a lot of variables. Owen Costello was determined to make it work when he was diagnosed and says the key is don't expect perfection. When I start something new, I'm probably going to see some highs and I'm probably going to see some lows. And I think being aware of that, first of all, is very important because you're not going to be as frustrated or discouraged when you do inevitably see these highs and lows. Owen was diagnosed as a young adult. He has his own podcast. And we talk about managing different kinds of workouts, treating lows at 3 a.m., and lots more. In Tell Me Something Good, Type 1 Diabetes and Space Force Did we just see a big barrier, U.S. military service, come down? This podcast is not intended as medical advice. If you have those kinds of questions, please contact your healthcare provider. Welcome to another week of the show. Oh, we're so glad to have you here. You know we aim to educate and inspire about diabetes with a focus on people who use insulin. I'm your host, Stacey Sims. My son was diagnosed with type 1 back in 2006 at the age of almost 2, and he is now 16. My husband lives with type 2 diabetes. I don't have diabetes. I have a background in broadcasting, and that is how you get this podcast. I am just back from Podcast Movement, which is a really big podcasting conference. I've gone to it in years past, but I haven't been in a while. It was really fun to catch up, just like at diabetes conferences. You know, you see all your friends and you do learn stuff. And I was there uh, in a different sort of capacity, not just learning about my own show, but I'm working a little bit with a group called She Podcasts, which is, of course, podcasting for women. And I bring all this up just to say it was really interesting to see the difference between travel at the beginning of July, which was the first time I I really went to any kind of conference or in-person gathering that wasn't, you know, immediate family. And in July, we were certainly very cautious and and friends for life. The organization there did a great job at being smart about COVID and and doing everything they needed to do. But the difference this time was just the attitude and the feeling because of the Delta variant. You know, it was very interesting. Many more people were masking indoors than in July. Uh, Many more people were expressing concerns about traveling back and forth. And I, I don't bring this up to say anything other than it was an interesting observation. You all know as you listen, you know, this is a very educated audience. What's going on? I don't have to tell you anything. Um, If you follow me on social media, you might have seen that I was wearing a mask outdoors in downtown Nashville. I was kind of reluctant to go to downtown Nashville at all, but I'd never been there and I wanted to see all the bridesmaid stuff (laughs) myself (laughs) because it is like the national capital now in the U.S. for bachelorette parties. And yes, it lives up to that hype. It was amazing. But I, but I was wearing my mask outdoors. If you followed me on social, you saw that. And I, I haven't done that before, but it was crowded and a lot of young people. And, you know, in the U.S., the younger, the less likely to be vaccinated. So we, we took more precautions than we, I say we, than me, than I normally would have. Also, it was so much fun to meet some diabetes friends just as an odd coincidence. In Nashville last Wednesday, as you listen, Children with Diabetes, the group that puts on Friends for Life, had a very cool event with Mankind, the people behind Afrezza Inhaled Insulin, and they sponsored a fun time at a go-kart track with Connor Daly. He is an IndyCar driver who lives with Type 1, and he was in town because Nashville had their very first Music City Grand Prix. I will link that up. It was a very cool, very different kind of race, but Connor was very cool himself. He was super engaging with the kids. I will link up some coverage. There was a news story. Come of, some of the local news stations came out and, and made some videos, which was really nice. I got to meet Rachel Mayo, who is a very cool lady who lives in Nashville. And, you know, we're, we've connected on social media for years. Uh, she lives with Type 1. She works with the JDRF chapter there. And Ernie Prado, who's been on the show before, he works at NASA. I saw him at Friends for Life, and he told me if I was going to Nashville, I had to look her up. So, Rachel, it was so great to meet you. And maybe next time we will get in the go-karts. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> it was really fun, though. All right. Now, one of the things I mentioned podcast movement, but one of the things that's really fun about going there is meeting other podcasters. You know, we already have fabulous other shows in the diabetes community. There are lots of podcasts and more of them keep 
popping up all the time. I did sort of a swap with this week's guest, but we did it kind of backwards. I taped the interview you're about to hear with Own first, and then he interviewed me about a week later. But he has already aired the interview that he did with me. His turnaround time was quicker, so I'll put a link in the show notes to that. Owen Costello's show is the Insuloan podcast. It is great. Owen, you can hear the name in the title there. Owen was diagnosed almost 10 years ago at the age of 19. Now, he was very active, very much into sports at the time. And as you can imagine, very worried about whether he'd be able to continue. It's a bit hard to imagine now, but even 10 years ago, there wasn't the social media. There wasn't the communication we have now in the diabetes community. I mean, it's taken off for sure. But when you think about it, 2011 was still at the very beginning. So there wasn't a lot of information out there for somebody who wanted to run marathons or lift weights competitively, you know, that sort of thing. We had a great conversation about how Owen, you know, kind of found his way and he is now helping many, many other people. And he is, yes, he's from Ireland. I think his accent is much nicer than my, my New York accent, which occasionally comes out. I know you hear it here and there. Right, but first, Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Jivo Kypo Pen. Our endo always told us that if you use insulin, you need to have emergency glucagon on hand as well. Low blood sugars are one thing. We're usually able to treat those with fast-acting glucose tabs or juice, but a very low blood sugar can be frightening, which is why I'm so glad there's a different option for emergency glucagon. It is Jivo Kypo Pen. Jivo Kypo Pen is pre-mixed and ready to go with no visible needle. You pull off the red cap and push the yellow end onto bare skin and hold it for five seconds. That's it. Find out more, go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the Gvoke logo. Gvoke shouldn't be used in patients with chromocytoma or insulinoma. Visit gvokeglucagon.com slash risk. Own, oh, welcome to the show. It's great to talk to you today. Thank you, Stacey. Thanks for having me on. I'm actually uh, a longtime listener of the podcast, so it's a pleasure. So I appreciate it. Thank you so much. I was just about to say I really enjoy your podcast. It's kind of funny talking to a fellow podcaster. This will be nice. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. At least we were both used to speaking on a mic. Oh, you see, now you set it up. Now we have to like up the game. We really have to be good today. Pressure. <laughs> <laughs> Ed, edit that out. Edit that out. <laughs> I want to talk about your show and what led you there. But let's just start at your story's beginning. You were diagnosed with type 1 at, at 19. What was going on in your life during that time? Yeah, so I was kind of transitioning from high school. We, we just call it regular school in Ireland. <laughs> into college so i had done a year of like a portfolio course i was actually going to art college for animation it was around christmas time and i had noticed some differences in terms of how i was feeling obviously i was very tired i had lost about a stone and a half in the space of a month i was really thirsty all the time i just didn't have any energy and i suppose because i was 19 and i was kind of into fitness and training and keep myself healthy I had this I had this naive attitude of I'm 19, I'm invincible. How could there be anything wrong with me? Therefore, I'll just brush it all to the side. And it was around Christmas time. And, and in Ireland, we like to go to bars. We like to have a good time <laughs> around that. time. So I was seeing friends. I was having a few drinks. And if I was tired during the day, I would say it's only because I was out last night. Or if I was thirsty, it's because I had a few drinks the previous night. And it wasn't until my parents were kind of quietly concerned, but they had mentioned that I should probably go down to the GP, get a blood test and just to see if everything's OK. And I reluctantly agreed because I was kind of thinking, look, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. There's nothing wrong with me. But I, I gave in because I just wanted to keep my parents happy. <laughs> so hey, wait, let me just interrupt you real quick, just to translate over here. A stone is 14 pounds. So you lost 21 pounds. Yeah, it flew off me. A lot. Yeah. And in a very, very short space of time, it was about, I'd say, a month, a month and a half. But the thing about it was because you kind of see yourself every day, mm -hmm. I didn't notice it as much. And it wasn't until I'd seen a, a friend who I hadn't seen in maybe six months or so. I just bumped into her in the street and she said to me, you look really different. And I said, how do you mean? And she goes, I don't know. You just, you, you just look different. And she she kind of blurted it out and was embarrassed nearly but from saying it. But it was obviously because I had lost so much weight in, in such a short space of time. So basically, I went down to the GP, got a blood test. And a couple of days later, I got a, a phone call saying, is this on? I said, it is. Blood tests come back. You have type 1 diabetes. You need to go to the hospital right now. And I went in 
and my bloods were like 640, 640, so very high. And then that led me to my new life. <laughs> <laughs> was there any confusion about which type it was? Because sometimes as a young adult, they don't go type one initially. No, straight away they okay. they had told me it was type one, but I had barely even heard the word diabetes yeah. before. I obviously knew that it was a condition that people lived with, but I had no idea of the complexities of it or just the the detail that you have to now live your life by. But no, there was no confusion. It was type one straight away. And while I'm sure your parents were supportive, but very worried, I heard your brothers gave you an interesting welcome <laughs> while you were in the hospital. Is that true? Yeah, it is true. So I was I was in hospital. I think I, I stayed there for about three nights while I was on an IV and, and obviously getting the crash course in diabetes management. And my family, in a good way, have a dark sense of humor. We're nice people. We like to we like to think. Um, but around difficult times like that, sometimes it can be nice to try and keep things lighthearted. So my two brothers got a call from my brother and, and or my my dad. And we're obviously informed that Owen has been diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, is in the hospital. And on their way to the hospital, they picked up bottles of Coke, sweets, jellies, these kind of things to bring in as a joke. It kind of sounds weird if you don't, if you don't know us, but <laughs> it, came, it came from a good place. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, I think sometimes dark humor has its place for sure. If, if you know it's coming with love. That's really funny. Exactly. Of course. So you were already very involved, as you said, in fitness. I assume you played sports all growing up. What were you thinking at the time about what was to come next? Yeah, there was a lot racing through my mind, obviously. But one of the big things that stood out to me and one of my main concerns was, can I continue to play sport? Can I continue to be active? And for my whole life, I I'd, I'd played a lot of different sports. But at the time, I was playing football or I was playing soccer <laughs> at a uh, at a very high level. And I wanted to continue doing that. And because I didn't know anything about diabetes, I had almost automatically assumed that this would prevent me from being as active or playing sport. So it was obviously a a big adjustment in terms of how to manage blood sugar around exercises, as, as we all know. But as time went on, I kind of quickly realized that, look, you can, of course, still play sport. You can be active as long as you're still prioritizing your diabetes health. But the first while I was I was very concerned. It's interesting when you were diagnosed, you know, almost 10 years ago now, this is a time before a lot of social media. I mean, it was kind of just starting. But I guess what I'm asking is you have a huge Instagram following and other social media following and you post advice and you talk very openly about how to do what you do with type 1 diabetes. I've got to assume that wasn't available for you when you were diagnosed. How did you figure it out? How did you know what to do? Very, very good question. <laughs> it reminds me of when I kind of first got back to college, because when I was in class, obviously, I, I had just been recently diagnosed. And as you say, Stacey, there was no social media. There wasn't really any any sort of community based support groups that I could kind of connect with online and learn from other diabetics. And as we know, it can be very isolating to to live with diabetes because it's sometimes all consuming in your life. So at times I was thinking, am I the only person in the world living with this thing? And obviously I wasn't, but sometimes you can feel like that because it is so just on your mind all the time. But in college, I remember some days I was supposed to be doing work, but I might be behind the computer or the laptop just researching diabetes <laughs> stuff because I became obsessed with it in a really good way because I knew that, OK, this is a very, very serious condition. It's something that is out of my control now. I have it. There's nothing I could have done to bring it on. There's nothing I could have done to prevent it. But it's in my best interest now to know as much as possible. And for any diabetic out there, the more that we know, inevitably, the easier it, things can be. I kind of just became obsessed with it, obsessed with trying to understand how different exercise would affect me, how stress would affect me, how lack of sleep would affect me, how hydration, different foods, these kind of things. And it was it was almost like a, a guilty pleasure. I was just constantly, constantly looking it up and researching it. We're going to talk about what works. And I'd love to get some advice for everybody from, you know, the very casual athlete to somebody who's really, really more involved in fitness. But I got to ask, did you have any 
mishaps in the beginning? Did you try anything that you said that's not going to work? <laughs> Right back to Owen answering that question. But first, bottom line, you need a plan of action with diabetes. We've been lucky that Benny's endo has helped us a lot with that and that he understands the plan has to change as Benny gets older. You want that kind of support. So take your diabetes management to the next level with Dario Health. Their published studies demonstrate high-impact results for active users, like improved in-range percentage within three months, reduction of A1C within three months, and a 58% decrease in occurrences of severe hyperglycemic events. Try Dario's Diabetes Success Plan and make a difference in your diabetes management. Go to mydario.com forward slash diabetes dash connections for more proven results and for information about the plan. Now back to Owen answering my question about whether he's tried something in his workout or his diet routine that just didn't work. Thankfully, I didn't have anything too <laughs> dramatic. <laughs> Thankfully, I, I highlight. But yeah, of course, there's so much trial and error with diabetes. And from through, well, throughout the last 10 years, I have just had thousands of highs, maybe not thousands of lows, hopefully keep, <laughs> keep them less. But the more that I tried different things, the more that I tried to get out there, the more exercise that I did, kind of testing different foods with different amount of in, amounts of insulin. There's just so much trial and error. So, but thankfully, I didn't have anything like DKA or I wasn't kind of rushed into hospital. But well, fingers crossed. Yeah, let's keep let's keep it that way. <laughs> so it was more so just the highs and lows as they come rather than anything too serious, thankfully. Well, and I'll be, I'll be clear Owen. I was thinking more like you ate a banana before a workout and it was not the right idea oh. it wasn't so much like dka i mean I don't, okay i'm not too worried about you know that kind of mistake i was just thinking about something smaller but that's up to you yeah of course there's times where i remember when i i think it must have been a few weeks after i was diagnosed and i was kind of getting back into the gym but i was also kind of coming into a honeymoon phase quite quickly after i was diagnosed and i was taught and i was learning to carb count for one unit of insulin for 10 grams carbohydrate and I remember I, I finished a, a workout in the gym. I went down to the changing room to get changed, have a shower, and I had a banana. I weighed out the banana. It totaled 50 grams of carbs. So I thought, okay, perfect. I've weighed it out. I've done everything I'm supposed to do. I took five units of insulin and ate the banana. But I hadn't fully realized the impact of a potential honeymoon phase. So I quite quickly plummeted and... I now I had to get two liters of orange juice in quite quickly, but um, just mistakes like that, just where you think you're on the right track with an insulin dose or carb count or something. And as diabetes does, it sometimes surprises you. No doubt. I hate bananas. That's funny. That's why I gave that as an example. <laughs> and then I'm, I'm not surprised really? that you had an incident with a banana. Ugh. No, just not, not <laughs> stay, away, stay away. Stay away. No, don't. <laughs> it's just not one of my favorites. <laughs> What kind of technology do you use? Do you use a CGM? Do you use an insulin pump? So I've always used MDI and I'm on Nova Rapid and Lantus, but only this year I've got a Dexcom G6. And as you can imagine, that's completely opened up my eyes to a 24 hour period with my blood sugar rather than just that snapshot in time with a finger prick. What motivated you? What led you to start using a CGM? It was more so they had become available in Ireland. So ah. Thankfully, in Ireland, we, we there's something called the long term illness scheme. So if you're diagnosed with type one diabetes in Ireland, all of your supplies are covered, which is unbelievable. But only recently they had included the Dexcom G6. So it was actually only offered to me almost a year to the day. It's been a game changer. It's just and particularly with exercise, it, it gives you so much more freedom, so much more confidence when you are to go to the gym or you are to go for a run or whatever it might be. It's so interesting with exercise because my son, who, who lives with type one, has played lots of different sports. And it's always amazing to see those rises in blood sugar that come not from food, but from exercise and the different types of exercise. And you kind of have to learn what to leave alone, what to treat for. Did any of that take you by surprise? Did you see those? I call them adrenaline highs. Absolutely. Yeah. I suppose what really surprises me and still to the day, what surprises me so much is the drastic difference between 
and this is obviously from my own experience, the drastic difference between heavy weight training mm. and something like a run. So to give you an example, if I was to actually only this morning, I was in the gym and I was doing relatively heavy squats. And when I work with heavier weights, my blood sugar skyrockets. So I've now gotten to the stage where more often than not, I will have to pre-bolus for a heavy leg workout because I'm anticipating that big spike. Whereas if I'm to go for a run, I'll know that after, say, 20, 30 minutes, my blood sugars are inclined to trend lower. So ideally, I always try and go for a run with little to no insulin on board. That's why I like to run first thing in the morning. And then we're training in terms of weights, depending on what it is I'm training. Like if I'm doing heavy squats, I may need to pre-bolus as if I'm having a meal, which, wow. which is strange. Yeah. Yeah. But you have to figure all that out. I mean, it's, it's incredible. And I always feel like just when we have one sport figured out, he decides to change. So. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Oh. Keep you guessing. Right. You can't quit baseball. You, we figured it out. No, he's done baseball and basketball, football, a little bit of lacrosse, and now he's really enjoying wrestling. So I think wrestling is going to take us through high school. We are still figuring it out because it is, you know, practice is super intense with lots of cardio and then sometimes weight on alternate days. And then the meets are just a lot of standing around and then these bursts of energy. So, you know, it's... And what would Benny's blood sugar, react? how would it react if he was, say, doing an intense wrestling session? Well, the practices are to the point where we have, the, I'll give you an example, the very first wrestling practice he ever went to, he ate 85 uncovered carbs during the two hours. He just had having to stop. No way. It was unreal. It was <laughs> unreal. He was, he's an active kid, but at the time, this is two and a half years ago now, um, he wasn't as fit as he is now, to be quite honest with you. He had taken himself on as kind of a project and between eighth grade and now he's about to be a junior. So two and a half, three years, he's really transformed his body. He's gotten a lot more fit. He's lost weight. He's muscled up. It's been it's been fun to watch and kind of inspiring as the mom who just like walks the dog and works out a couple times a week. Casually. <laughs> but he's really done well. So that first practice, though, was amazing. So we knew we had to make some changes. So we, you know, we adjusted insulin. And as he exercised and became more sensitive, right, he responded better to the insulin. We were able to make a lot of adjustments. So if he knew it was a heavy cardio day, he would change his basal rates going in. And having control IQ with tandem has kind of changed that. But still, um, if it was a heavier weight day, he actually he kind of wait, not no pun intended. He waits out the high. He doesn't like mm. to dose for it too much because he will drop. Um, and then during a meet. He just tries to kind of ride it, but he is 16 Owen. So sometimes that means ignoring it, mm. <laughs> to be quite honest with you. I can imagine. <laughs> and just getting through. So as his mom, I'm like, you know, if you just gave yourself a little bit, you could. He's like, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. And it is fine. He's doing very well. He's very healthy. Our endocrinologist is pleased. So I can't really criticize him, but I but I'd like to. <laughs> <laughs> as mothers would. Right, well, I'm right. sure. Look, he's he's in fantastic hands, obviously. But it's it's amazing to hear that he has stayed so active and, as you say, changed his body and seen the difference with even the insulin requirements. Oh, yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, it's been great. So let me get I don't want to talk all about us. Let me get back to you. Sorry. <laughs> when you talk to people about diabetes and fitness and let's be honest, you are you know, fitness seems to be kind of your job. This is something that you are really passionate about. I'll share some videos and some photos. If you haven't seen Owen, he's he. I mean, are you a model? You are a fitness model in some ways, right? Uh, I know. Um, a terrible question. You're going to laugh at me. I'm regretting. <laughs> I'm, well, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm with a, a modeling agency in Dublin, but it's not my my full time job. OK, so you can imagine how fit he is to have that as even a part time job. So let's start, though, by talking about people who are moderately active with diabetes. Right. They may not they may not expect to be on the cover of a, you know, a fitness magazine, but they want to get in better shape. What kind of advice do you have for somebody who is worried about going low or is, is hearing us talk about these highs and isn't quite sure what to do? Where do you start? Yeah, absolutely. Good question. And it's it's something that I always touch on, too. I make it quite clear that because I am so into fitness, I would never expect anybody to you know go to the gym five or six days a week and go out for runs multiple times a week. It's 
what I do, it's what I love. It's not for everybody else. But it's important that as a diabetic, we have some sort of activity in our life, whether that be going for a short walk a day, whether that be playing tennis, whether that be going for a swim, anything that you enjoy is the first piece of advice. Mm. It's important that if you want to exercise or if you're trying to introduce a new sort of regime or routine into your into your life, it's important that you enjoy it, because if you do, you're a lot more inclined to continue to do it and continue to see the benefits from it. So if somebody is concerned about the highs that I was speaking about or, or the lows that I mentioned with runs, there is so much trial and error. And it's important that people always re- remind themselves of when I'm starting something new. And this can be with any aspect of your life, but particularly with diabetes, when I start something new, I'm probably going to see some highs and I'm probably going to see some lows. And I think being aware of that, first of all, is very important because you're not going to be as frustrated or discouraged when you do inevitably see these highs and lows. But if I was to offer somebody advice who is trying to start walking or trying to start, say, even a light jog a couple of times a week, the first thing is to always be prepared for a high or low blood sugar, particularly a low blood sugar, because the impacts of a low can obviously affect you quite quickly. So the first thing is always have your low treatment and start small. You don't need to aim to run a marathon quite quickly. You can think, OK, I'm going to start this week, walk around the block, see how my blood sugar reacts. I might do two walks around the block, see how my blood sugar reacts to that. So instead of that kind of all or nothing mentality, you really need to ease your way into it. Because when you ease your way into things, you can steadily see any patterns or trends with your blood sugar. It might not be the best idea for somebody to say, "Okay, I haven't gone to the gym ever before, but I want to start going. Therefore, I'm going to go to the gym six days a week. Yeah, it's going to be very, very, very difficult to understand how your body and how your blood sugar reacts to that. It could be I'm going to go to the gym one day a week and I'm going to see what my blood sugar is like before. I'm going to see what my blood sugar is like during and after. And if you're aware of the trends and patterns, like I said, with your blood sugar, it gives you more confidence over time. And the more confidence you have with your blood sugar, the easier it is to continue to do more. And then for the people who want to do more, because we have quite a few people who listen to this show who are very much dedicated to fitness activity athletics, you know, for those high achievers, any tips to kind of stay at that high level or get there? I think a lot of that would depend on what that specific person's goal is. Mm -hmm. But if it is, say, to change your body composition, for example, and you really enjoy going to the gym, you like lifting weights, you can see your body changing over time and you want to continue doing that because it's it's what you love. Again, it's about enjoying it. But the priority will always be your blood. And I think no matter who you are, what you do in terms of your exercise, whether it be intense or just kind of casual each day the priority is always blood sugar always 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 for me anyway that's that's how i feel about it and i think if you have a good understanding of how you're reacting to these certain things then again it gives you the confidence to to push further and further and further and further if that's what you want to do so to give another example from from my own experience since the lockdown in ireland the gyms had closed now they're open back up, thankfully. <laughs> but when the gyms closed, I got big into running. And the first few runs that I went on, it was, again, a lot of trial and error. I would see a few lows. I would see my bloods dropping at a certain distance or a certain time. But the more I did it, the more my confidence grew. And then the more you do, you can kind of see yourself setting yourself goals. So I did a, a running challenge, which was 48 miles over 48 hours so you'd you'd run four miles every (laughs) yeah so it was four miles every four hours for 48 hours and before i started running i was thinking oh like could i could i do that um like would my blood sugar get in the way is that realistic but the more that you do you can kind of see yourself getting closer and closer and closer and closer to doing these things so if there is somebody who as you say stacy is a, a high achiever or really enjoys their training. If you have that goal that you want to work towards, you can tweak your training or or even tweak your diabetes management towards that. 
if that makes sense. Yeah. I'm curious, though. You said, you know, the blood sugar is your top priority. What do you mean by that? Do you mean staying in range, just knowing where it is? Uh, you know, when you say your blood sugar is the most important part of your working out, can you just talk a little bit about what you mean by that? Yeah, of course. So, I mean, not even specifically with training, just in general. I always, without obsessing about it too much, I always like to prioritize my diabetes health. And for me, that is trying to keep my time and range in range as much as possible. Because I know that if I'm fluctuating high and low and my time and range isn't where I would like it to be, that can almost immediately affect my quality of life for that for that day. Because I know that my bloods are up and down, I'm not going to feel the best. I'm going to feel as if I'm on the back foot to my blood sugar, kind of chasing them. So I always like to be as prepared as possible so that I can almost look ahead those two, three, four, five hours into a time where I'm working out to see, OK, I've eaten I've eaten this meal. I've taken this insulin. How can I expect that to react when I say I prioritize it? I prioritize it because I know that I won't be in the best form or I won't be able to train as much as I would like if I'm having difficulty with my blood sugar. What do you like to use to treat lows? Do you have a go to? <laughs> when I'm disciplined with lows, my go to's are these lift glucose drinks or else dextrose tablets. Mm. But easier said than done <laughs> when, when you're not having low blood sugar. But it's a whole different story when you're waking up at 3 a.m. with a low blood sugar. <laughs> and then yeah. if I wake up at 3 a.m. with a low blood sugar, the kitchen is just raided. And it's I always say I'm like a bear going into a picnic sometimes. <laughs> just can't be stopped. <laughs> Well, it's, you know, it's nice to know you're human. I mean, that's that that takes a lot of discipline to just go for the, the tabs. It depends on how low I am. If I'm dipping just underneath the time and range, it's easy enough just to stick to the glucose. But if, if I know I'm going lower, it's game over in, ter in terms of the treatment. And I know that then I'm I'm going to inevitably see that kind of rebound high. Yeah. Do you have any foods that you really like to indulge in every once in a while? There is chips or crisps, we call them over here. And they're like, um, really, really, oh, they're beautiful. These really <laughs> crunch. You're making me think about them now. <laughs> Just these really crunchy salt and vinegar chips, as you call them. And they do these massive bags in Ireland. So I always have a few of them in the house just to I probably eat them too often. <laughs> but <laughs> may, maybe that's why I train so much. <laughs> You know, I did want to ask you about your podcast. I, I'm curious, you know, I, I know, I mean, I was in broadcasting. I know why I started my show, gosh, many moons ago. Why did you start your podcast? How did that come about? I had never planned on it, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And I think when I initially set up an Instagram page to, as you said earlier, Stacey, to, to kind of help give people advice that I, that I might be able to offer or, or just experiences from my own life, it was almost like a snowball effect where, the more that I shared, I felt as if the more I had to say. And then it, it almost came from a sort of selfish standpoint because I really wanted to interview other diabetics. Mm. And f like throughout the past 10 ish years, I've always learned more from other diabetics than I have anybody else. So I felt that having a podcast gave me an opportunity to speak to as many diabetics as I could and to hear from their experiences. So it was to get other people on to share their experiences. And some of the guests that I've had on have been amazing. And I know you're going to be on shortly, which I, which I can't wait for. <laughs> but as well, I call this the Insulone podcast, Redefining Diabetes. And I called it that because, well, for two reasons. Number one is I feel that diabetes is so globally well known. Everybody knows that it exists, but it's so widely unknown. And people don't truly understand the the intricacies of it that you're just a normal day entails. Mm. So I called it redefining diabetes because I want to hopefully redefine what society see diabetes as and also more importantly, what a diabetic sees their diabetes as. It's really important for me that any diabetic out there realizes that, look, it's not an ideal situation to be in. As we know, it's a difficult condition to live with. But if we can learn to redefine that in our own head and kind of scratch under the surface to see what positives can we take from this? It doesn't have to just be a negative impact on our life. 
there can be positives from it. And I feel from sharing some of my own experiences and more, and I suppose particularly more with the guests, it helps get that point across. I've had people who've climbed Mount Everest, ran across Canada. Chris Rudin, who's a motivational speaker, who has obviously been on your podcast too. Mm. And I just think it can offer a lot of people value, as your podcast does. You've, you've been going for years now, and I know there's obviously thousands of people that get such a massive benefit from this. So I'm hoping that they do too from my podcast. I'm sure they do. It's a great show. But before I let you go, I'm curious, you know, you want to redefine diabetes. So if you look back at Owen 10 years ago, right, in the hospital, your brothers are bringing you soda (laughs) and candy and, you know, giving you a hard time. Would you say that at least to yourself, the definition of diabetes that you got that day, that in these 10 years since that you you redefined that for you? I would like to think so. Yeah, I think if I was to put myself back in that hospital bed those that 10 years ago and to see how far I've come, even just in terms of my own management and how I view my own diabetes. Yeah, I think I've redefined it for myself, which I'm proud of, I have to say. Yeah, you should be. It's OK to say <laughs> that's great. Well, Owen, thank you so much for joining me. It was a pleasure to talk to you. I'm looking forward to talking to you for your show. I'm I'm always, it's a little weird to flip the microphone around and be interviewed, but I'll try to behave (laughs) myself. But thank you so much. Great. Thanks so much for joining me today. Thanks, Stacey. And can I just quickly say, I just want to thank anybody who's listening. I know that anyone who listens to the podcast is obviously looking for value. And I know that your time is an important asset. So I hope you've been able to get something from this episode. And Stacey, I'd like to thank you because this podcast for me personally has has brought me a lot of value and it's uh, offering people, thousands of people out there, um, huge support and reassurance around their diabetes. So from a type one diabetic, thank you and I appreciate you. You're listening to Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. More information about Owen in my show notes. You can always find out everything at diabetes-connections.com. If you're listening in a podcast player, it may be a little difficult to see everything. Some of them don't support the links or the transcript I put in. You can always come on home to diabetes-connections.com. I I so appreciate talking to Owen. Um, It was so kind of him to say what he said there at the end. I never know what to say, but what what a nice comment. And I really do appreciate that. And I do highly recommend his podcast, The Insulowen podcast. It's a lot of fun. He's so engaging, as you heard, and it really is terrific. Please check it out. Up next, we're going to talk about Space Force. Did you hear about this? Guy with type one made it in. What does that mean for military service in the U.S.? We'll talk about it. But first, Diabetes Connections is brought to you by Dexcom. Dexcom has a diabetes management software called Clarity. Do you use this? Because for a very long time, longer than I'd like to admit, I thought it was just something our endo could see. But it's really helpful. Now I have it on my phone. You can use it on both a desktop or as an app, and it's an easy way to keep track of the big picture. I find I use it a lot when we're adjusting things, you know, which felt for a long time like it was nonstop. (laughs) At age 16, Benny kind of seems to be leveling out on growth and basal rates, at least for now. But Clarity really helps us see longer term trends and helps us not, you know, overreact. The overlay reports help put context to his glucose levels and patterns. And when you share the reports with your care team, it's easy for them to get a great idea of what's going on and then they can better help. Managing diabetes is not easy, but I feel like we have one of the very best CGM systems working for us. Find out more at diabetes-connections.com and click on the Dexcom logo. An article from Stars and Stripes was making the rounds. This is a military publication. And you may have seen this really interesting. Tanner Johnson was due to graduate from the U.S. Air Force Academy in Colorado when he was diagnosed with type 1. They allowed him to return, but they referred him for counseling and they told him this is going to be the end of your military career. But he told the counselor, I want to stay in. What if we could demonstrate that I could do it? He was able to get in front of the academy superintendent and talk to him. And apparently that personal meeting made a big difference because Lieutenant General Richard Clark reportedly went to bat for Johnson. There's not a lot of detail in the article about the process here, but Johnson was allowed to graduate in 2021 and he was accepted into the Space Force. 
If you are not familiar, um, this is, and I don't blame you because it's very, very, very new. Uh, U.S. Space Force is the sixth independent U.S. military service branch. Of course, it is tasked with missions and operations in the space domain. Um, it was signed into law at the end of 2019. And honestly, I, I know a lot of people think that this is something that uh, former President Donald Trump just kind of made up and put into existence. But the idea has been around since the 50s, and it was seriously considered in the early 80s by Reagan. So I only say that to say this is part of the U.S. military. I saw a couple of uh, Facebook comments about Tanner Johnson questioning whether this was really a military service assignment for somebody with type 1 diabetes. I believe it is. Is it combat ready, right? Because can you be deployed when you have type 1 diabetes is still the question. And that certainly doesn't seem to be something that is being planned for with Space Force. So I obviously have a lot of questions, as I'm sure you all do as well. So I reached out to the reporter who wrote the story and said, you know, can you connect us? I'd really like to talk to Tanner. And she reached back immediately. It was fabulous. I was so grateful for that. Thank you, Karen. And she said, I will ask him, I will reach out. But he just started training with Space Force and he will need authorization from leadership to talk to you. She said, quote, they tend to say no. So we'll see what happens. If you know Tanner Johnson or you could get me an interview with him, please reach out. Let me know how to be connected because I have a lot of questions as I know you do too. But what an inspirational story. What a big first step for the U.S. military. We've talked to other people who have been diagnosed while they are already in the military and they've been able to stay active. But I don't know anybody who was diagnosed during training who was able to stay in. So we'll keep following this one. But I'm putting this under tell me something good because, man, that's the last big barrier. We've got, you know, airline pilots in the last couple of years can be type one now. Military service is the one that we still, you know, after that, it'll be astronaut. So <laughs> I think it's fantastic. If you have a tell me something good story, please reach out Stacy at diabetes-connections.com or post in our Facebook group. I ask there periodically. I love sharing good news. Okay, before I let you go, just a reminder, join me on Wednesday. Every Wednesday on Facebook Live, I do a very quick five to six minute newscast, give you the headlines in diabetes of the last week, all types of diabetes, not just type one. And then I turn that around. We make it a podcast episode on Fridays. But if you want to watch, that's Facebook Live and then it's on YouTube. And I, you know, I put it all out on social. This week, if you're listening as this episode goes live on August 10th, the Facebook Live is going to be earlier. I'm still actually making my schedule because Wednesday just is some kind of bananas day. I, and I have to do the newscast earlier. So watch the Facebook space. It'll probably be three o'clock in the afternoon, 3.30, something like that. It's usually 4.30 and I, I'm getting a great response. So I'm so glad you all seem to enjoy it. Thank you very much. If you have news tips, send them my way too. And that's it. Thank you so much to my editor, John Buchanis from Audio Editing Solutions. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Stacey Sims. I'll see you back here in just a couple of days. Until then, be kind to yourself. Diabetes Connections is a production of Stacey Sims Media. All rights reserved, all wrongs avenged.